Okay, so yesterday we went over Newton's third law. Okay, and we said that Newton's third law tells us about how all forces act in pairs. Okay, when there's an action force, there's always a reaction force. And most of the time we call that reaction force the normal force. Okay, Newton's third law is very closely tied to how friction works because friction is related to how hard two surfaces are pressed together. So it's dependent on that reactive or normal force. All right? And we talked about this yesterday. We said the formula that calculates the force of friction contains only two variables. Mu, which is the coefficient of friction that tells us how much the two surfaces stick to each other. Okay, or how hard it is to slide them past each other, and the normal force. That is, how hard those two surfaces are being pressed together. Okay, so those are the two things that can affect the force of friction. Right? The nature of the two surfaces and how hard they're being pressed together. Right? So if I'm looking at this desk here as an example, okay? so I've just got it sitting on the floor. If I want to slide it forwards, Okay, I would simply push on it and it would <laughs> Okay, I just push horizontally, it slides horizontally, I've got very little issue. But is there friction there? How do I know? Uh, yeah, resistance. there was sound, I could feel resistance okay, when I tried to do that. So I had to overcome that friction. Okay, But that friction is only dependent on the nature of the bottom of these pads that are on the bottom, the feet of the desk, and the floor, okay? which is a fairly high coefficient of friction. We don't want desks sliding around when people are sitting there. Okay? So there's a fairly high coefficient of friction between them. Okay? And the other part of that equation is the mass of the desk being pulled into the floor by gravity, and then the floor pushing back on the bottom of the desk. Right? Everyone with me on that? Okay, now, same situation, same desk, same floor, but now instead of pushing the desk horizontally, now I lean down on the desk and push it kind of into the floor and forwards. Now what's happening? Too much friction. There's too much friction. Like, I'm pushing really hard. I've got all my weight into this thing, and it'll barely move. Okay? Whereas just a minute ago, I pushed it with my fingers. Okay? What changed? Right. I increased how hard the two surfaces were being pushed into each other. Okay? And as a result the force of friction increased, okay? Because I made this force bigger, okay? I didn't change this. It was still the same two surfaces. All I can do is change the amount of normal force, okay? This has so many real-world applications, especially with winter coming, right? How many people are getting their winter tires put on soon? Plenty going on tomorrow. My wife always makes me put them on before November. I'm always like, come on, I don't want to drive on those crummy, ugly wheels for like seven months, but it's, it's the right thing to do, it's safer. Okay, um, but we're getting those put on tomorrow. Now, why are winter tires better than summer tires on ice? Because they have a tread specialized for it. Okay, usually they have a specialized tread pattern. Right, in low temperatures they don't harden. All season tires tend to harden at about five degrees above zero. Okay? Below that temperature, summer tires are very hard, and as a result, they don't take the shape of the road nearly as well. Okay? And that reduces their ability to channel water and grip the road surface. Okay? So winter tires are made of a softer material, and they have a different tread pattern. What part of the equation are they manipulating? Yes. Yeah, when they're harder, they're going to create less friction with the road. Yes. Yeah, they're changing mu. Okay? Your winter tires increase mu. Okay? You'll have greater coefficient of friction against ice with winter tires than you will with summer <coughs> tires. Okay? Part of that is the tread pattern. Okay? The tread pattern, if you've ever looked at winter tires, okay, they have tons of cuts in the tread. They're called sipes, actually, but there are lots of little cuts that summer tires typically don't have. What those sipes are responsible for is to siphon water off ice as your tire moves. Okay? So as your tire makes contact with ice, it changes its shape a little bit and flattens. Water goes into the sipe and then is, as the tire rotates, pulled away from the ice surface. What that does is ensure that rubber is meeting ice and there isn't a water interface in between. Okay? Because 
can water act as a lubricant? Yes. Okay. So the winter tires help to pull away that layer of water that forms as a result of tires spinning on ice. Okay. So these winter tires are pulling that away, and they're helping to reduce, or sorry, to increase mu. Okay. They're also made of softer rubber, which increases mu. Okay. Even in the summertime, okay, they're going to have an increased mu. The problem with using some our winter tires in the summer is what happens to them. They wear down really fast. They're really soft. Okay? And so in the summertime, when the, when the road temperatures are very high, your winter tires just wear out. Okay? They will just literally wear right out. Okay? It doesn't mean they don't work great. They work just fine. But they wear really, really fast. Okay? All right. Um, so that's one way we can increase our traction in the coming winter months. What's something else, especially in Alberta, that we typically do? Especially if you have pick Okay, uh, salt and gravel on the roads. We do that. That's more. Um, that's more of a like a mu thing. When we put salt on the road, we lower the free, the melting. Or sorry, we raise sorry, lower the melting temperature of the ice, so it melts more quickly. The sand it serves a small traction purpose, but the purpose of the sand is actually to lower the albedo of the snow and ice that is absorbed more solar energy and help it to melt faster as well. I mean, certainly, if there's sand there, you're going to get a little more traction because it will bite into the uh, into your winter tires and stuff. But um, it's that's part of it. But what else? Okay, we might use four-wheel drive. Okay, that gives us more um, more places where we can create a forward force. Put weight in the back. Yeah, I put weight in the back. Okay. Um, a lot of people throw bags of sand or hay bales or things like that in the back of a pickup truck because if you don't have anything in the back of the pickup truck and you have rear wheel drive, you don't have very much of this. Okay? By increasing the weight of your truck, you increase the normal force and that increases the force of friction. It does nothing for your fuel economy, obviously, but okay, it will increase your traction because now your truck will be heavier. Okay? The lighter the vehicle, the less traction is going to happen. Yeah, you put tire chains on them, and again, that's that's going to just like bite in. That's going to increase mu. Okay, it's going to be now metal instead of rubber. Okay, it's especially useful if you're in like really really deep snow. Okay, then then it can be helpful. Okay? Like um, in some places in BC, I think when you watch that show Highway Through Hell, about the tow trucks on the Coca-Cola, it's actually a pretty good show. Um, but uh, they yeah, you have to chain up. Like they make all the trucks pull over when it starts to snow, and they have the tire chains on the trucks. Otherwise, the trucks will actually slide backwards down the mountain. Okay, when it starts to get slippery, and then it causes these big pileups, and then the tow truck guys can show up. It's really cool physics, actually, which is why. Okay, which is why it's such a cool show. But, okay, besides that, you should watch it at least once. Okay, there's a lot of cool physics and how they get these wrecks out of the ditch and all that kind of stuff. It's crazy. All right, so, everyone understand kind of how the formula for the force of friction works? Okay, there's only two things that affect the force of friction the coefficient and the normal force. That's it. Okay. Now, there are two different kinds of friction. What is mu measured? It actually has no units. That's a good question. What's mu measured in? Nothing. Here's why. If I manipulate this formula for mu, I'm dividing the force of friction by the normal force. That's newtons over newtons. Newtons cancels. Coefficient of friction is just that. It's just the coefficient. It actually has no units. It's more of a ratio. Okay, like how much of that normal force will be converted to friction? So we're multiplying kind of by a percentage. Okay. Um, there are two different kinds of friction. That's where I was going. Okay, two different kinds of friction. There is kinetic friction and static friction. Okay. If something is static, what's it not doing? Moving. Okay. So static friction happens when two surfaces do not slide past each other. Okay? Kinetic friction happens when they actually slide past each other. Right? So there's two counts. Now, which one's better in terms of getting your car going? Not kinetic. Okay? You spin your tires, that doesn't move you forward. Does it? Okay? You get the best acceleration and the best movement forward when your tires aren't spinning. Think about that next time you're one of those people on the hill out there trying to get out of the parking lot and you're just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. Back off the gas, okay? Back off the gas. The slower your tires go, the more traction you're going to have. The kinetic friction is always lower than static friction. 
Okay? So you're going to get better traction by not spinning your tires. This is why all the kind of modern uh, sports cars and things like that have traction control systems. Okay? They divert power from spinning wheels to gripping wheels in order to maximize the amount of forward force that they can generate and allow them to accelerate better. Okay? It's why, unfortunately, okay, the Tesla can out-accelerate the health. Okay? Like the Dodge Challenger, like, like 800 horsepower, something ridiculous like that. You know, it's all, it's all gas and screaming engines and stuff. Um, but um, it, it doesn't accelerate as fast as the electric Tesla because the electric Tesla will not overpower its wheels. Okay? The electric motors will not allow the wheels to spin. Okay? And as a result, it puts power to the road way better and can accelerate faster. It doesn't look nearly as cool because it's not shrouded in entire smoke and howling like the banshee. But yeah. Anyway, I'm ranting. Okay. So friction, there's kinetic friction and there's static friction. Static friction is better if we want to uh, maximize the amount of traction that we're going to have. Okay. Similar thing if you're cornering. Okay. Um, if I'm going around a corner. Okay. And I start to slide, okay, rather than doing this, what do I do? Right, I do this, okay? There's still some kinetic friction there. You can hear it. You can feel it because you crank your wheels over, but your car keeps going straight. You ever watch Canada's Worst Driver? That's like the funniest one to watch, okay? The one where they're supposed to slow down on the slippery surface and try and turn, and they all go right through that styrofoam wall. <laughs> Why are you guys looking at me like you never watched that show, okay? You really have to watch that show. It's really, really funny, okay? Like idiot drivers, and you just know that they're the people that are going to hit you on the road one day. But anyway, um, so you got you got the, the corner. You're trying to turn the corner. Okay, if you rely on static friction, you'll turn the corner very easily. Once you get this kinetic, you're going to start to do this. Okay, this is why. And actually, the MythBusters did this one time. They proved that in a race, someone who corners properly versus someone who drifts a corner, the person who doesn't drift will always. They actually brought in the Drift King guy from Japan, okay? And they raced him. Adam and Jamie ran this course in a car. Didn't didn't drift any of the corners. Did it as quickly as they could. They're not even professional drivers. Then they brought the Drift King in. He drifted all the corners and could not be the corners, okay? Because he wasted time getting the car to come back around because he was always relying on the kinetic friction to try and propel him forward instead of just relying on the static friction to push. Yeah, it look. I mean, make no mistake. Watching the guy drifting the corners look way cooler. Okay, it looks faster because it's just it's tire smoke and it looks cool. But it isn't faster. Okay, one type of friction is better than the other for pushing forward. All right. So this was the example I did here just a minute ago. Okay, a person pushing on a desk. Nobody would try and move a desk the way I was trying to do there because it doesn't make any sense. Okay, you push the desk into the floor, of course the, the floor is going to push back harder and it's going to be harder to move the desk. Okay, the easier way to move the desk would have been to do what? Yeah, you might pick up the front of that desk and walk out. It's really easy. Okay, it's really, really easy. If I have any downward force, that's it's making it harder. Okay, but if I pick it up, then I'm reducing some of that normal force, okay, and I'm reducing the amount of friction that's involved. Okay, so what we end up having here, okay, in a situation like what I was doing the wrong way, is I've got my applied force like this. Okay, it has both a horizontal and vertical component. Okay, so there's a vertical component here, and um, spoiler alert, this might help you with question number nine. It's a suitcase question on your new assignment. Okay. It's, it's opposite, but it's still kind of like that. Okay, so there's an applied force that's angled, okay, and then it has a horizontal component and a vertical component. Okay, if I redraw, so if I draw this free body diagram, not like this, I'm going to have this applied force, okay, I'm going to have gravity, I'm going to have uh, normal force, okay, and then I'm also going to have. Okay, this vertical force. So I actually don't know what normal force is right now until I know what this is. Okay, because it's going to add on to here. I've got gravity and my pushing force pushing down. Everybody follow there? 
That means since the, the desk isn't moving vertically, that normal force is the sum of both of them and is as a result much bigger. Okay? The opposite would be true if I was pulling the suitcase along the floor like this, kind of like in question number eight on your Newton sign. Rather than adding to the normal force, perhaps I'm taking some away. <laughs> okay. So static friction. Okay, static friction means the surfaces are not sliding past one another. All right? In that case then, what's the net force for an object if they're not sliding? Zero. Okay? If I have a static frictional situation, I'm pushing on the desk, the desk is going. Okay? That means the net force in this situation is zero. Everyone okay with that? Okay, so when, if that's this situation, okay, that means that this applied force forwards is equal to the force of friction backwards. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? They balance out. Okay, in a, in a kinetic friction situation, then the object is going to accelerate, and as a result, then I'm going to have a net force that's not zero. Okay, um, so let's have a look at that exact example here. Okay, so I'll have you guys write this one down, right, and then we're going to walk through it together. So the magnitude of the applied force in this question is 165 newtons. So this arrow here is 165 newtons. It's angled 30 degrees below the horizontal. Okay, the desk remains stationary. We want to calculate the force of static friction acting on the desk. So in questions like this, if I have an angled force, I tend to draw two diagrams. Okay? The first one I draw is like the desk diagram that they have here. And I draw on here my angled force. And then I draw its parts. I say, okay, it's got a horizontal part, which I'll call force horizontal, and it has a vertical part, which I'll call force vertical. Okay. Then I draw a free body diagram, but I don't include the angle forces. I just include the x's and y's, because it'll be easier to calculate, because I know the box isn't doing what? It's not moving. I know everything adds up to zero. Right, so, what I do then is I put in these forces. I take okay, my force vertical, I put it here. Okay, I take my force horizontal, I put it here. Okay, I put on my other forces, force of gravity. Okay, I, take, uh, I put my normal force on here. Okay, now, what do the force of gravity, the force vertical, and the normal force add up to in this question? Zero. Is the desk moving? Okay. So vertically, the net force is zero. Horizontally, the net force is also zero. Okay. So I've drawn those on there, but in the end, they really didn't matter all that much. Okay. Then my other force here is the force of friction. How does the force of friction relate to this force horizontal? Are equal? Why are they equal? Because it's not moving. Right. The net force is zero. Right? So now, I can go back to this diagram and say, okay, I know the hypotenuse of this triangle. I can find what that horizontal force was using trigonometry. Okay? I've got the angle. I've got this side. I can find that side using cosine. Right? So I'm going to go um, 165 times the cos of 30 degrees. Okay, so that side is 143 newtons. So what's my force of friction? Negative 143 newtons. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay. I put a 10 kilogram block on this 20 degree inclined plane. Set it there and it doesn't move. 
calculate the force of friction. That's all the information you need. Okay? I set this thing on this ramp and it didn't move. Calculate the force of friction. Spoiler alert, I may not have drawn all the forces involved on this diagram as of yet. What's the net force in this question? Zero. Box isn't moving. That was the key point. I set it on the ramp and it didn't move. Okay, so the net force is zero. Now, if you set something on a ramp, something pulls it down the ramp. What is it? Not gravity. F parallel. F -parallel. Gravity tries to pull it through the ramp. Okay, F parallel is what pulls it down the ramp. Okay, so how are F parallel and the force of friction that's keeping it from sliding down the ramp related? They're the same. Right. The net force wouldn't be zero if the force up the ramp and the force down the ramp weren't equal. So I have to find F parallel. Can I find it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I draw my usual inclined plane thing here, okay, where I got force of gravity. So that'll be 98.1 newtons. Okay. I've got F parallel on this side, okay, and I've got my 20 degree angle. So sine of 20 times 98.1. My F parallel is 33.6. I said I only have two significant digits there. 34 newtons down the ramp. So my force of friction is or 34 newtons up the ramp. Okay. So again, not a lot of math there, but a fair amount of thinking involved. Now, inclined planes start to get a little bit involved when we start bringing in the friction formula, okay? Because we're going to start dealing with having mu, okay? Mu is a number, right? It's going to be most of the time a decimal, okay? But it may start getting involved in some of the questions that we do on an inclined plane. Okay, because we know sometimes we have to calculate the force of friction using this formula. Now, if I'm on an inclined plane, where do I get Fn from? It's not the opposite of gravity. It's this side. Remember, F parallel is the vector sum of the plane pushing straight out and gravity pulling straight down. Okay, so F normal is the other side of that triangle in the inclined plane. Now, is that going to be very hard to calculate? No, just like there's cos, there's something about that side of the triangle. As long as you've got the weight, you can always get the normal numbers. Okay, but it's going to come into play in a couple of questions here. Like this one. I want you to write it down. We're going to walk through it together. Okay? So, I put a 20 kilogram box on this incline plane. I push up the ramp with 120 newtons worth of force. The coefficient of friction between the box and the ramp is 0.125. I want to calculate the acceleration of the box. Um, what other forces are acting on the box? Gravity. Okay, and gravity will be 196.2 newtons, okay, 20 times 9.81. And normal force. And F parallel, which would be here. This angle is 25 degrees here. Okay. Um, what other force is acting on that box? Friction. Right. It says right here, the coefficient of friction is 0.125. They wouldn't give me that if there wasn't friction involved. Which way is friction likely to be acting? Down the ramp. If I'm pushing the box up the ramp, friction's acting down the ramp. Okay. So I know how much force is up the ramp. I need to calculate the acceleration of this box, which means I need to know the net force, which means I need to calculate F parallel and the force of friction. 
Now, we already know how to calculate F parallel. Okay, so we can calculate that pretty easily. F parallel is going to be the sine of 25 degrees okay, times 196.2. Okay, so our F parallel is 82.92 newtons. All right. How do I get force of friction? I can see by by F normal. Right. I use the friction formula. Okay. The force of friction can be calculated by multiplying mu by the normal force. I don't have the normal force yet, but can I calculate it? Mm -hmm. Yes, because it's part of this triangle right here. Okay. It's this side. We've never had to calculate it before now. Okay. It's the first time we've ever bothered with that. Right? But in this question, I need to know what it is. So to calculate normal force, I'm just going to go cos of 25 times 196.2. Okay, that's my normal force, 177.82 newtons. I want to calculate the force of friction, so I'm going to multiply that number by... 0.125, right? Because my formula for force of friction is mu times the normal force. This is my normal force. Multiply that by 0.125. Okay, so I have 22.23 newtons worth of friction. Okay. Now I have all the forces acting down the ramp and all the forces acting up the ramp. And I calculate the net force. So net force will be F parallel plus the force of friction plus 120 newtons. Okay. So that's going to mean F net will be uh, negative 82.92 min or sorry plus negative 27.23 plus 120. minus that number. Okay, so I have a net force of 14.86 newtons. Can I now calculate the acceleration? Is that working standing outside? Okay, so now I've got my net force. Now I can calculate the acceleration of the box by taking this number and dividing by 20. All right, so the acceleration of the box is 0.74 meters per second squared up the ramp. Okay, so it's it's one other thing, right? It's one more force. Oh crap, I got another formula. I've got to manipulate. Yeah, it's not the end of the world, but right, it's it's in there. It's one more thing to do. Okay, questions on how that one works? Uh, we just did one like that, so we'll skip that one. That one. And that one. And that one. Let's step on here, go on. Okay, let's try this one. I want you guys to write this one down and give it a try. So I have a three and a half kilogram block sliding down a 15 degree incline. The surface of the incline exerts a force of kinetic friction of 3.9 newtons on the block. Calculate the acceleration of the block. Okay, so it's sliding down the ramp. Which way is friction acting? Okay, that's something you have to consider. Right. Um, this one's a lot easier than. Oh, you know what? We're not gonna do that. Oh, it's too easy. Okay. All we have is a okay, force of friction, and they gave us that, and F parallel. Those are the only two forces involved, right? They gave. We don't even have to calculate the force of friction. They gave it to us. We, we've done one harder than that. We just did one harder than that. I'm going to take it a step backwards here. But that one you can try. Whoever wrote that. 
Okay, give that one a try. Write it down and give it a try. Okay, we want to find the acceleration of a 20 kilogram block on a 40 degree incline that has a coefficient of friction of 0 0.85, 0 0.185. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. So we've got our incline. It's pretty steep. It's 40 degrees. Okay, we've got a uh, 20 kilogram block sitting on it. Okay, we're told the coefficient of friction is 0.185. Now, um, that means friction is likely acting up the ramp. Okay, because it does say like it's it's on this ramp. It doesn't say it's being pushed up the ramp. So the only direction that it can be moving is down the ramp. Okay, now what's pulling it down the ramp? F parallel. Right. Okay, gravity pulls straight down. Okay, that's the thing we have to remember. Every time I say what's pulling something down the ramp, the answer is F parallel. Okay, gravity pulls it straight down. Normal force pushes straight out from the surface. That's what gives us F parallel. It is the vector sum, tail to head, of normal force and gravity. Okay, that's where we get F parallel from. It's why things move down ramps. Okay, it's the interaction between those two forces. Okay, if I want to calculate the acceleration of this block, then I need to calculate both of these forces. Agree? Because they don't know either one of them. So I can calculate F parallel pretty quickly. Okay, I'm going to have Fg here, which would be 196.2 newtons. And I can calculate F parallel from that. So sine of 40 times 196.2 will give me my down the ramp force. Okay, so sine of 40 times 196.2. All right, so the force down the ramp is 126.115. All right. If I want to calculate the force of friction, the formula for that is mu, which I have, times normal force, which I can calculate. I don't have it yet, but I can calculate it because it's this side of the triangle. All right. So I'm going to go normal force will equal the cos of 40 degrees times 196.2 times the hypotenuse. So the cos of 40. 96.2, right, gives me 150.298 newtons. Okay, now that I have normal force, now I can calculate the force of friction. 0.185 times 150.298. All right, so the force of friction on this ramp is 27.805 newtons. So I've got 27.805 acting up the ramp. I've got 126.115 acting down the ramp. Is this thing definitely accelerating down the ramp? Yes. Can I calculate the net force now? Okay. Yes. All right, so F net will be uh, 126.114. 929, okay, uh, minus my answer from before. Okay, so my net force is 98.3 newtons down the ramp. If I divide that by the mass, 20 kilograms, find that my acceleration is 4.9 meters per second squared down the ramp. Okay, a lot more calculating? Yeah. yeah. A lot more calculating, but same reasoning as before. Okay, it's always still sum of all forces, F equals M times A, okay, all that just comes, we just have more forces to calculate now, is really the only difference. All right, questions on that one? Okay, just to give you an idea here, guys, some, some of the coefficients of friction between surfaces, okay? Copper on copper is incredibly high friction. Okay, so sliding copper past copper okay, is really, really difficult. There's an incredibly high coefficient of friction. Steel on dry steel, okay, quite a bit lower, only 0.41. Okay, steel on greased steel, 
Okay, this is why we grease things. Okay, why we use oils and greases and stuff. Okay, it reduces the coefficient of friction and thus reduces friction and wear. Right? Dry oak on dry oak. I don't know who comes up with these. But, okay, so 0.5. Um, a rubber tire on dry asphalt, pretty high. Okay, that's what we want. Okay, a rubber tire on wet asphalt, half. As soon as the pavement gets wet, you're going to have half as much friction as you had before. Okay, reduces it significantly. Okay. Rubber tire on ice. Yikes. Okay. Remember that when it gets slippery. Don't be that guy. Like the one who was sliding down the hill towards me the last time it snowed. Okay? Like down this hill here. I'm going slow because the person in front of me is going slow and some guy behind me is on the brakes. How can you tell someone behind you is on the brakes? Yeah, because their headlights are doing this. Okay? Because they're trying to stop because they were going too fast and it was really icy. Okay, um, so yeah, very very low coefficient of friction. Okay? That can be a problem. Curling stone on ice. That's why they slide so well. Now, in paint drying, curling, curling. Okay, <laughs> they can turn the rock. They can make it go faster. They can make it. They can make it go farther. What do they do? They sweep. Okay, you ever seen them? Okay, they're, they're out there and they're like, hurry hard! And they're doing all that, that weird stuff the curlers do. Okay, um, and, and there's a, there's people that are in front of the rock and they're sweeping. What are they doing when they sweep? Yeah, they're actually melting the ice. Okay, if you've ever seen curling ice, what they do with curling ice is they first make a sheet. And then a guy goes out there with a garden hose and he puts droplets of water into the air. They fall onto the sheet of ice and they make little pebbling. On the, on the curling ice surface. So curling ice and hockey ice are totally different. Okay? Hockey ice is smooth. Curling ice is rough. Right? When the people are sweeping in front of the rock, what they're doing is melting those little beads. And that creates a layer of water between the rock and the ice, which reduces the amount of friction there is between the rock and the ice, allowing the rock to go further. They can even change the path of the rock by sweeping more on one side of it. Okay? If they sweep more on one side than the other, one side has more friction than the other, and it'll turn in the direction of more friction, because it slows down more in that direction, and it'll actually turn. Okay? So people that are really good at that, they okay, can actually steer a rock to some extent as it goes down the mess. Okay? In addition to the fact that you can spin it, there's like that in turn, out turn, or something. Grass okay. field. Okay. Um, yeah. That one we don't need to do. That one we don't need to do. That one we don't need to do. Where's the one I want to do? That one. Ah, this is the one. No. Not the one. <laughs> That's the one I want. Okay. This is the one. Well, it might be useful. I, I, it's not that I always put this question on the unity pool. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. Um, I've got this 20 kilogram box. Oh, this 20 kilogram box. It's the same box every question. Um, we have this 20 kilogram box on a level surface. Okay. I am pulling it with 400 newtons worth of force at a 10 degree angle. So that's way more than 10 degrees, but you get the idea. Okay? So I'm pulling it at an angle. It is sliding along the floor towards me as I walk. Okay? I want you to calculate the acceleration of the box. Okay? We did one like this, like almost right at the beginning. I said it's kind of important for one of the questions on your assignment. Okay? It will also be important for one of the questions on your test. Okay? And your unit exam. Coefficient of friction between the box and the surface is 0.255. Okay. I want you guys to calculate the acceleration of the box. Give you a few minutes on that one. Remember, you have an angled force. My suggestion would be break this force down into its horizontal and vertical components. Okay. The box is only moving horizontally. It is not moving vertically. <coughs> Okay. One of the keys in this question is that the box is sliding along the surface. Okay, it's not moving in the direction of that 400 newton force. Everybody with me on that? 
Okay, it's moving horizontally. So one of the first things I want to do is eliminate the angle force by finding its horizontal and vertical components and then putting them on the free body diagram. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do then is find out what the horizontal component of that 400 newton force is. So that'll be the cos of 10 okay, times 400. All right, so the horizontal component of that is 393.923. Okay. So I've got that force there. Now, this also has a vertical component, which is really not that big because that's not really a 10 degree angle, so I'm going to draw it quite a bit smaller. Then I'm going to find that by going sine of 10 times 400. All right, so that one's 69.459. Newtons. Okay, so I'm just going to move these forces out of the way here. Okay, now I'm going to get rid of this angled force. I don't need it anymore because I figured out how much it's pulling horizontally and how much it's pulling vertically, and I'm just going to put those back on my free body diagram. Okay, so I've got that force acting upwards. Okay, um, what other forces need to go on this diagram? Gravity. Okay, which will be 196.2 newtons. What other force needs to go on here? Normal force. How big is the normal force? Nope. That's the mistake. That's the mistake everybody makes. We make that assumption. It's whatever right okay the box is not moving vertically so the net force up and down is how much zero that means that there are 196 newtons acting up but 69.459 of them are from the handle because when you pull something at an angle you lift it a little bit now not all of its weight is against the floor anymore there's still 196.2 newtons pulling down, but the floor doesn't have to push that hard anymore because now what am I doing? I'm holding some of the weight. The floor doesn't have to exert upwards as hard if I'm pulling some of it. That's why it's easier to slide the desk by pulling up and away than by just pulling horizontally, right? Which makes way more noise if I pull it horizontally because there's more friction. If I pull up, and away, it's way easier because now there's not as much normal force, and thus, not as much friction. Okay, everyone follow me there. So, can you get that normal force? You're going to need it to what? Calculating the force of friction. Right? Okay, keep going. Remember, we're trying to find the acceleration of this block. Okay, that should give you a pretty good way to do it. All right, so. If we're going to calculate the acceleration of this box, we have to first recognize it's only accelerating horizontally. The net force vertically is zero, and I need to get the normal force if I'm going to calculate how big the force of friction is, because the formula for the force of friction involves mu and the normal force. Okay? So to get the normal force, I know that my upward force has to add up to, to what? Right, to the force downwards, which is 196. Okay, so I've got 196 newtons going up, 196 newtons going down. So to get the normal force, I take my 196.2 and I subtract my vertical force there. Okay, whatever is left, this much, is my normal force. Okay, because I would add up to a total of 196.2. Everyone okay with that? So now I know what my normal force is, 126.74. Okay, hey, now that I have that, I can calculate the force of friction because the question told me what mu is. Okay, so I'm going to take my force of friction okay, and say that it equals 0.255 times 
Okay, so the force of friction acting backwards is only 32 newtons. Pretty small compared to the forward force, agreed? Okay. Can I calculate my net force now? Yes. So I'm going to take my 393.9231012 um, and subtract the number, the force of friction here. There's my net force. It's big. Okay. How do I calculate my acceleration? I right, divide that by the mass. All right, so this thing's going to accelerate at two g's, like almost twice the acceleration due to gravity. Almost. Right, so that's a pretty significant jerk. Okay, like whoever was whoever was pulling this thing just really just yanked on it really hard. Okay, because that would, that's a pretty massive acceleration. Okay. Everyone kind of follow what we did there, right? There's a lot of angles in there, a lot of things to remember, but guys. This is the big thing, okay? Remembering that normal force doesn't always equal the force of gravity. It does if there's no other vertical forces. But in this case, we started out with an angle force that had a vertical component, okay? Anytime I pull upwards or push downwards on an object, I'm going to change the amount of normal force. I'm either going to make it bigger or smaller. What won't change is the force of gravity, okay? Everyone alright with that idea? Okay, just little things to think about. Yeah. Um, okay, try that one. That one's a little easier because it's just being pulled horizontally. Okay, there's no angle force here. Just being pulled horizontally. So give this one a try. 20, it's the same box. I'm trying to save your work actually. The force of gravity is the same for every single question. It's always 196.2 to save It's not that I'm forgetful. Actually, it is. Okay, so for this one, okay, we've got the 20 kilogram box being pulled horizontally by a force of 200 newtons. Okay, so we got 200 newtons forward. Okay, coefficient is 0 0.800. So this is a very sticky surface. Okay, it's a very high friction surface. What's the acceleration of the box? All right, what are the other forces here? Gravity. Right, so 196.2 newtons and normal force, which is how big? Same as gravity. How do I know in this case they're equal? There's no other vertical forces. Okay, I'm not pulling it at an angle. It specifies it's being pulled horizontally. Okay, which means that these two forces are equal. Now, why do I need this force? In order to find friction. Friction is the other force. Okay, it told me the coefficient of friction is 0 0.8. That means there's friction. So what I have to do then is figure out what is the force of friction. The force of friction is mu times the normal force. So that'll be uh, 0 0.8 times 196.2. Okay, it's 156.96. So I've got 156.96 newtons acting backwards. I've got 200 newtons acting forwards. These two forces cancel. Can I calculate the net force? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the net force will be 200 minus our answer. Oh, not 20. 200 minus 156.96. Okay. Uh, so 43 newtons forward. Okay. I get the acceleration by dividing that by 20. All right, so this box is going to accelerate at 2.15 meters per second. Actually, sorry, we only have two significant figures. 2.2 uh, meters per second squared forwards. Okay. Everybody all right with that one? Okay. So once in a while, you're going to run into a question where you're going to have to use this coefficient of friction in the friction formula. It could be an inclined plane. could be something like that. It could be like the one that we're pulling at an angle. It will be on your task. That one, okay? Because um, that that allows me to test basically everything about Newton's second law: vectors, sum of all forces, m times a, friction, okay, all of that stuff. I can test it all in one question, and the test can be shorter. Okay. It's all about you. About you having a shorter. Okay. Um, I just put up on the board here the date for your unit exam. Okay, that's two weeks and a day from now.
Right, so you got lots of time to start preparing for that. Okay, but we're going to start into work energy theorem on Friday. I okay, think tomorrow we're doing the lab on friction. So um, Friday we'll start um, work energy theorem. We'll do work energy theorem next week. We'll do uh, conservation of energy after that. And then we're done. Okay, so there's not much, not much left to that. Shortly, uh, we'll be confirming the details for our uh, West Edmonton Mall physics trip. Okay, uh, right now it is looking like it will be Tuesday, November 26th. Right, so um, keep that date in mind, especially if you have a part-time job and you need to book time off way ahead of time. Okay, it's looking like Tuesday, November 26th. I don't know that for sure yet, but it's pretty likely it will be that day. Okay, um, probably in the next week and week or two weeks, we'll give you your permission forms. You'll have to take those home, get them signed, pay your fee online, pay uh, for the trip, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then we'll be going there at the end of November. Okay, uh, weather permitting, of course. We've only had to postpone it once. And then we got home. <laughs>